Thank you, Gregory. Hello, Cisco. Can we get the uh, clicker? Thank you. Good deal. Can I leave this here for you? Hello, Cisco. Thank you for the introduction. And we'll go for about 50 minutes. Then I'll take about eight to 10 minutes worth of questions. It's a bit on who I am. I've written a bunch of books. The most recent is Message Not Received. But before I wrote and spoke for a living, I spent 10 years consulting in organizations, helping them implement different technologies. So I've become a bit of an expert, although I don't love the term. I also do some public speaking. And as I'll talk about in a little bit, I am a recovering email addict. Now, before I get going here, I thought that it was really important in preparing this talk to put forth the following disclaimers. Because to me, communication is very personal. And truth be told, 15 years ago, I really wasn't a particularly good communicator. So the words that we use, the devices that we use today are very personal. So to that end, I am not omniscient. There's plenty that I don't know about technology, about business, about language, but I like to learn. Nor am I the world's best communicator. Again, I'm not Dale Carnegie. I like to think that I'm reasonably good at it because I write and speak for a living. But occasionally, people don't understand me. And occasionally, I don't understand other people. And these thoughts were very much on my mind as I sat down to write the new book. And then finally, I am not the arbiter of what is or is not jargon. In preparing for this event, Carolyn and I went back and forth a few times. And she had sent me a note about how a vendor kept using terms like affinitize and incentivize. Now, I was with her on affinitize. That seems a little jargony to me. But I don't mind incentivize. In fact, I like that a lot more than the word incent, because that, to me, really isn't a word. My point here is that there is no such thing as a jargon judge. Although when I think about jargon and the definition of it, I go back to the 1976 definition of pornography from Justice Potter Stewart. And if you don't know it, it's a classic one that can be applied about everything. When asked what just is pornography, he said, I don't know it. I'm sorry, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. So, Now, before I started writing and speaking, I spent a lot of time on IT projects. And I can recall very specific instances in which I didn't understand what clients were telling me as a consultant, or on the client side, what consultants were telling me. And I could talk for hours about what salespeople would say and how it would go over people's heads. And I decided that enough was enough. As Gregory has mentioned, I had written a bunch of books about big data, about platforms, about technology and trends. And then I came to the realization for book number seven. Yes, I could write about the Internet of Things. I think it's fascinating. It's going to be huge. I don't have to tell you guys that. But I couldn't shake this feeling that unless we understood all this technology and data, all this was meaningless. So we have to understand it. And I decided that I was on a mission to simplify business communications. And as you'll find out, if you don't already know, I enjoy a good quote. And one of my favorites is from Jerry Seinfeld. Any Seinfeld fans out there? Great. We'll talk later. And he said in one of his comedy routines, we never should have put a man on the moon. Why? Because now you can say we can put a man on the moon, but we can't insert name of task. So in this case, we can put a man on the moon, but we can't communicate effectively at work. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is that, in my opinion, the solution is well within our reach. And as I'll talk about today, if we embrace simpler language and new tools, we will be less overwhelmed at work, and we'll communicate more effectively, and our chances of something good happening actually go up considerably. Now, again, I'm a big fan of quotes, and this one is absolutely one of my favorites. It comes from George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright, who said, the biggest problem in communication is the illusion that's taken place. That is actually right on the jacket of the book. And it's so true, because when we think about it, when we communicate, we typically think that we're being clear. I have never met anybody who ever said, yeah, I'm not being very clear here. And I'm going to cite some research a little bit later from the book that shows that people tend to think they're being clear when their messages aren't received. Right? This is a very natural human belief. We think that we're being clear. Yet, business communication is fundamentally broken. Does anyone recognize the two characters here? No? Breaking Bad, you get a book signed. Actually, everyone gets a book, but you get a special book. So Breaking Bad is my favorite show, and I, I throw in a lot of pop cultural references when I talk. So why is business communication broken? In short, we send way too much email, and I'll talk about that in a bit, and we use way too much jargon and confusing language. Now, I like to make these talks interactive to the extent that I can, and I want to think about how much email we receive in a given day. Now, that's an abstract number, because if we're checking email 10, 20, 30 times a day, we're playing whack-a-mole with our email. Right? So I want you to think about right now how many unread messages are in your inbox. Right. Go ahead and everyone stand up. I can't see you in Poland or at RTC. But I want to try an experiment here. 
Go ahead and have a seat if you have fewer than 25 unread messages in your inbox. Okay, I saw a few people, okay. Next up, 50 or under. Does anyone have under 50? Okay, under 100. Those of you standing up have more than 100 unread messages in your box. I'm scared to ask how many you have. But everyone can go ahead and have a seat. So the problem is we get way too much email. Right? And again, I'm a recovering email addict. In the book, I talk about my moment of clarity on a project. I was sending emails to everyone because we were migrating systems. And I was sending these very long, detailed emails about where we were in the project. And a woman came up to me around 2 o'clock and said, what's the status? And I was a bit perturbed. I said, didn't you get my email? And she just chuckles and goes, which one? And it hit me like a bucket of water. I was trying to communicate, but I was confusing people. So I am absolutely a recovering email addict. But the problem is not email. The problem is very much how we use it. I am not anti-email. I had a few friends say, I don't know how to communicate with you anymore because of your new book. In fact, I recently had some problems with Google Apps and correctly marking things as spam. And a very good friend of mine said, you have ticked off the email gods. They are getting back at you. Right? So the problem isn't email. In fact, email offers a number of very significant benefits. Why has it caught on? I got my first email in 1992, and it was amazing. But at the time, I was one of the few people at email. I went to Carnegie Mellon. It's a very technologically savvy school, et cetera, et cetera. So why is email so pervasive today? First up, it's ubiquitous, right? When was the last time that you ever went to a networking event or exchanged business cards with a partner or a vendor, and that business card did not contain an email address? I bet you it hasn't happened in at least a decade. So everyone has email. It doesn't matter if we're using different protocols, different companies. We can email pretty much anyone we want. It's also incredibly convenient. I remember back when I first started out of college, working in companies, and there were intra-office memos. Watch Mad Men if you don't remember what they are. You literally have to print things out, put them in an envelope, and they would get shipped to someone in the same building or someone in a different building of the same company. So it's become incredibly convenient. It's also incredibly cheap. I had a discussion for MIT as part of one of the interviews for the book with a guy, and I said, you know what, we should tax email, one penny per. And I guarantee you that if you send 100 emails a day, at the end of the month, if there were a $20 deduction on your paycheck, you'd go, really? Do I send that many email, emails? But of course, we don't, because it's free. It's also incredibly fast, right? Long gone are the days in which email takes 10 or 15 minutes. Again, there are exceptions. But for the most part, email arrives just about instantaneously. Or if you use Outlook, I'm a Mac guy now, but what is it, F F9, the shortcut? So email gets there very, very quickly. And think about it. If email had the same friction it did 15 years ago, we wouldn't send as much of it. Does anyone remember having to go into an office and dial in through a VPN at home to send email? Well, now you're sitting at Target, you're online, you're sitting in traffic, and you shouldn't do this, but you take out your phone and you check and you send email. So this lack of friction explains why we send so much of it. Again, it can be a very good thing, but we overdo it. Email is incredibly reliable. Yes, there are glitches in the matrix. There are times in which email does not arrive to us for some reason. I actually just experienced that with Google Apps. But those are the exceptions that prove the rule. 99% of the time, far higher than that, we get the emails that are sent to us. And it's also very secure. I know what you're thinking. What about the Sony hack? Again, that's the exception that proved the rule. We've all hit reply all on an email when we meant to reply to one person. We've all mistakenly forwarded one, and we've gotten in trouble, and I've done it as well. But for the most part, email is very secure. And finally, and here's a 50 cent word for you, email is asynchronous. What does that mean? It means that if I want to send Carolyn an email at 2 in the morning, you don't have to check it at 2 in the morning. Right? You can check it two days later. Right? That's a good thing, but we rely on it so much because it's so convenient. The telephone doesn't work that way, right? Yes, forget voicemail for a minute, but if I want to talk to you on the telephone, we both have to be doing it at the same time. So it's very easy for us to rely on email, but again, we have gone way, way, way too far. Is anyone here a Dilbert fan? Okay, here's one of my favorites that sums it up just about better than I can. So we're not always clear when we send email, but again, we don't realize it, right? Is the problem really with email? I would argue no. The problem is with how we use it. It's so easy for us to demonize email and to demonize PowerPoint, right? And we've all seen very bad PowerPoint presentations. Hopefully this isn't one of them. 
but no one forces you to put 26 bullets on a slide. No one put, forces you to put figures that people have to squint to see. You can keep your slides very spartan, and I really try to do that. So again, the problem isn't email, the problem is how we use it. But it's so comfortable for us to blame technology because technology can't blame you back. PowerPoint can't say, wait a minute, you're confusing me. Right? Email can't say, unless you tweak it, I suppose, you're sending too many emails, right? People do that. So we love to blame the tool. We blame the Indian, not the arrow. That's what we ought to do. No one forces us to send all these emails. I golf and I've often gotten mad at my clubs and occasionally thrown them, but in reality, I'm the person who swung it. Now, when I say we spend a great deal of time using email, that begs the question, how much? Because I honestly don't think that people realize how much time they spend in their inboxes. Because if you checked email one time a day and saw you had 300 messages, you'd probably say is something really wrong here. But if you check it 10 times a day and there are only, only 30 messages, then you don't really understand the extent of the problem. Does anyone know what percentage of time the average knowledge worker spends sending and responding to emails? Take a guess. 30? Great guess. It is around 28% according to the McKinsey Global Institute. And in many instances, that translates to three or four hours per day. Now, that seems like a really big number. And if you haven't figured it out, I like math. And I also like The Simpsons. So let's do some math. Here's an equation that isn't going to make a lot of sense to you right now. But it does. If we send and receive 150 emails a day, and let's say we spend about a minute on each email. Some are more, some are less, but let's just use some basic numbers here. You're looking at roughly 150 minutes or 2.5 hours a day. Now, let's say that you're comfortable with this. It's about a quarter of the day, right? If you spend 10 hours working, two and a half hours, right? Here's the problem. Email is growing at a rate of 15% a year. You may accept the fact that email is basically the default communications medium in corporate America. I don't know how you could possibly dispute that. I'd argue that other than maybe the internet browser or some co companies, Microsoft Excel, email is the killer app. But if these numbers are going up by 15% a year, something has to give. But let's say that you only receive 100 emails in a day. Right? So if you work eight hours, that's 12 and a half per hour. Where are we going with this? Well, let's run some math here. And according to Experian, email is increasing at about 15% per day. So if you get 100 emails now, by 2020, you can expect to receive more than 200. Now, unless you can figure out a way to cram more hours in a day, something has to give. This isn't sustainable. This brings up one of my all-time favorite quotes from Nick Bilton, who writes for the New York Times about business and technology. He's also written the excellent book, Hatching Twitter. Has anyone happened to read that one? Fascinating book, very dysfunctional culture. Email is the most invasive form of communication ever invented. And I would have to agree with that. But maybe you're still not convinced, right? How does this impact the bottom line? Again, I'm a data guy, so let's look at some numbers. I argue in the book that relying so extensively on email is actually bad business. And this is particularly true because this isn't 1997. Was anyone in the workforce in 97? There were nascent knowledge bases and intranets, but they weren't very good, certainly in comparison to some of the tools that I'll talk about later. There really is no excuse for not adopting some of these tools, but many people don't understand just how much this impacts the bottom line. And at a macro level, we're looking at about $1 trillion a year, but that's not my number. The McKinsey Global Institute came up with this. If we adopted these new collaborative technologies, we could expect to save about a trillion dollars a year. Now, that was in 2012, and just to give you some context, because again, that's a really big number. So big that I think it's actually 25 times Uber's valuation. So you know it's big then. If we adopted these tools, what would happen? Right? If the US economy in 2012 at a GDP gross domestic product of 15.4 trillion, you're talking about a six to 7% savings just from embracing new tools. That's significant. But again, $1 trillion is a very large number. Let's talk about a specific example here at Cisco. And again, in preparing for this, Carolyn and Gregory and I had a couple of calls. And on one of them, Carolyn had mentioned to me that there was a particularly thorny data issue with two groups in Cisco. It's a global company, so across the pond, as they say. And for two years, these folks went back and forth over email, trying to solve the issue. And it didn't get solved. 
Let me go back to my Jerry Seinfeld quote. We never should have put a man on the moon because we can do that, yet we can't seem to solve a data problem. Well, in fact, that data problem wasn't so thorny. And when those two groups finally got together in person, right, they wound up actually hashing it out. So communicating over email wasn't terribly effective. And again, in my opinion, there's no excuse because even if you discount a lot of those tools, there's a little something called, oh, I don't know, the telephone. Or you happen to have incredibly sophisticated video conferencing equipment, and many companies don't. So this begs the question, if email can be so toxic, so inefficient, why can't we get off the email train? And this is one of the most interesting things, I think, in the new book. At a high level, the answer is human, not technological. As I said, go back 15 years, you can make the argument that the tools were kind of clunky. These days, you can play around with a lot of these tools. Many of them operate under a freemium model, so you can basically kick the tires for free. Because of cloud computing, it's not like you have to have software vendors come in and install them, and six months later, maybe you can try it out. With a lot of these things, you can sign up for an account and start playing within minutes. There are scores of tools available. There's a reason that Microsoft bought Yammer a few years ago for 1.1 or $1.2 billion. It was a collaborative suite, not totally dissimilar from SharePoint, but here's the thing. SharePoint was a bear to set up and administer. Yammer was very organic. Yammer grew its user base because people said, oh, there has to be a better way. What's this? They tried it out. In fact, one of the case studies in the book includes a company that uses Yammer. Again, this is not 1998, but those are very high level explanations. Why can't we get off the email train? Well, first of all, we're just used to it. If you send and receive 100 emails in a day, let's do some more math. Five days in a week, 500 in a week, 52 weeks in a year, forget vacation. Ah, we'll give you vacation. Say four weeks, 24,000 times a year you send and receive email. If you do something 24,000 times in a year, you're going to get pretty good at it. So we're just used to it. Email is also official. Companies will indicate um, restructurings, announcements, departures. It's basically the formal means of communicating with employees. So again, I understand it. But there's also a CYA component to email. I might have concerns. Let's say that I'm a Cisco employee and we're going to go in a new direction. And Carolyn and I have lunch six months ago. And I go on record saying this is the wrong idea. It's going to hurt us, et cetera, et cetera. And guess what? I was right. It's been known to happen once in a while. Well, then six months later, I say, hey, Carolyn, remember we had that conversation. Maybe Carolyn remembers it. Maybe she doesn't remember it that way. Maybe she doesn't remember it all. Maybe Carolyn, I won't say, got hit by a bus, but won the lottery. So there's something official, and we've all done it, myself included. When I was on particularly con contentious consulting projects, I made sure to document things in email because I knew that as soon as I left, people would say, he never told us that. So we're all guilty of it as using it as kind of a CYA component. And again, email is so easy these days because we can just whip out our smartphones. This is a lot different than 15 or 20 years ago. Imagine if there was friction, if you had to go to an office, if you had to log into a VPN, I guarantee you we would send fewer emails. But there are more reasons why we can't get off the train. This is particularly true in many IT departments. We fear personal interaction. I might have to have a difficult conversation with you, and I don't know exactly how to do it. Managing people is tough. I always understood technology because for the most part, computers do what you tell them to do. People, totally different matter. I can craft that email over days if I want, but if I have a conversation with you and I say something I shouldn't, I can't really take that back. In many instances, people complain about email, but they secretly crave it. Right? They've actually done studies on this. When we receive emails and text, we get a surge of dopamine. Right? We in, in the workplace, we like to feel important. Oh, it's true. So we complain about it, but imagine not being copied on an email. You're not important. Maybe the company doesn't need you. Right? So there's a sense of security knowing that even though you get a bunch of emails, you actually need to be copied on them. There's a reason that the vast majority of Americans will check in the email at work. Right? You're on a beach somewhere. Guess what? You have your smartphone. Researching the book, I found that Americans take only about half of their allotted vacation time. So many of us are focused on hyper-employment, right? There is no kind of cushy job in many organizations. So we crave email. And then there are cultural norms. I absolutely rub some of my clients the wrong way because I would find different ways of doing things. In fact, this happened uh, recently with um, just some friends of mine scheduling a meeting. We were trying to talk about our vacation plans, and they were trying to set up a time. And we all went to Carnegie Mellon for crying out loud. We know how to use technology. Even the poets there know how to code. 
yet they kept doing this over email. And I came up with these tools we could use to set up a time. One email, you pick a box. Green means good, red means bad. Instead, they fought me on it, right? And these are people who are actually my friends, never mind my clients. So many times we just don't want to embrace these new tools. That's particularly true in the startup world compared to more mature organizations. In Las Vegas, where I live, there's a fairly vibrant startup community. It's certainly not Silicon Valley, we're trying, or Silicon Alley or some of the other technology hotspots. But if you go to a lot of these startups with 5, 10, 15 people, they use HipChat, they use Slack, they use a tool because to them, sending all these emails back and forth doesn't make a lot of sense. That's a greenfield site, and it's always easier in a greenfield site compared to a brownfield site. Getting people to change isn't easy, even if the technologies, I would argue, are much better. Sometimes we don't even know that these technologies are there. right? What do you mean there's something else? That's just the way that things are done. In other instances, it's simple laziness. We know about these tools, but we haven't used them 25,000 times in a year. I don't want to learn them, even though these tools are incredibly user-friendly, in my opinion. And guess what? If you don't like one tool, it's never been easier to go ahead and try another. And then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention how so many of us like to blame IT. Right? Oh, if IT would only give us the tools. Really? I've sat in so many presentations in which the first client answer was, can we export the data to Excel? Nothing against Excel. I like Excel. I've spent thousands of hours doing pivot tables and filters and everything you can imagine in Excel. But if the point is just to get things into Excel, then why are we spending limited time and resources on a new technology tool if you're not going to adopt it? So we like to blame IT, but in reality, if people don't use the tools, what's the point? And oh, by the way, we live in an era of bring your own advice, B-O-I-O-D. A lot of these tools you can use without the sanctioning of IT. So if, if email were so effective, then it wouldn't take two years to solve a data problem here. Now, email can be confusing within an organization, but it also be, can be confusing with people who have known each other for decades. Now, as Gregory mentioned, I write for a bunch of media outlets you've heard of, like the Huffington Post and Wired. And one of the perks of writing for HuffPo is that I get to reach out to real life rock stars who wouldn't give me probably the time of day if I said, hi, I'm Phil Simon, I wanna write about you on my blog. I wanna write about you for Huffington Post, which is, I think is the 91st most popular website in the world, gets a different answer. No one's gonna get this, but does anyone know who these guys are? I would be shocked. This is one of my all-time favorite bands. They're called Marillion, and they've been together since the early 1980s. The band has released 19 studio albums. They've played thousands of shows together. Check them out. I think they're really excellent musicians. And I got to interview the guy on the left here, Mark Kelly, who's the keyboardist, nice guy. Before we talked about what the band was doing, because that was the subject of the interview, he actually stopped me and said, hey, do you mind if we talk about your book? Yes, right? Of course I'll talk about my book, right? Why do I write them? And he mentioned that his wife runs a PR firm over in London. And he said that his wife was really interested in the book because she suffers from this deluge of emails. And he relayed to me a really interesting story. The band had gotten into a couple of disagreements with the drummer, who's the guy on the right, Ian Mosley, really great, good drummer. So they got on the phone with him. I said, why are you so upset? What are you talking about? Well, we were reading your email, and you seem like you have a bit of a uh, bee in your bonnet. He said, no, I'm good. Why? So think about it. Here's a band that's been together for over 30 years. They've gone to each other's weddings. They've toured thousands of shows together, yet they will misunderstand each other over email. If that happens with a group of five guys who know each other really well, what does that say for a department of 300 or an organization of 3,000? And oh, by the way, what if a bunch of those people are new hires? But that's just a single story. Let's look at some more data. A couple of researchers back in 2006 looked at, looked at communication via different mediums. And at a high level, they asked them, do you think that people will understand you? OK, seems like a reasonable question. And 80% of the time, people said, yes, others will understand me. I'm actually surprised that it's that low. What were the results of this study? Actually, a bit of a mixed bag. Listeners were able to understand the message fully around three times in four. OK, so that's reasonable, right? One in four times, I guess. But over email, only about half of the time could the recipients pick up on sentiment, things like sarcasm, things like whether or not there was humor involved. And many times, those are actually critical parts of the message. Yes, you can use emojis and emoticons, but people have different feelings about that. But that's not the worst part of the study. In my opinion, the worst part is that most of the time, those sending the messages had no idea 
that those messages weren't being received. That's why I love that George Bernard Shaw quote so much. And it isn't just email, it's also texting. And the authors discovered that text-based communication seems like it's real time, but we're missing things. I am not an expert on nonverbal communication, but those who are will tell you that 80% of communication is nonverbal. You can tell if my voice is going up or if I'm using a sarcastic tone or if I'm moving my hands or my facial expressions or telling you something. Email lacks those things. So I am convinced that there are better ways of doing it. But email also makes us dumb. If you miss a night's sleep and you go into work, you drop about 10 points on your IQ. That makes sense, right? You didn't sleep the night before. I'm, I'm not as smart today because I didn't sleep much last night. I can feel it. But if you smoke pot, your IQ only goes down four points. Anyone want to guess what constantly checking email does? It's the same as missing a night's sleep. In other words, you're better coming, off, coming to work high than going to work and constantly checking your email. By the way, anyone recognize the, the picture there? Big Lebowski, you get a book. <laughs> okay, this is the one with the video. Email also obscures key data and relationships. And this chart here comes from a company called Smartsheet. And they created this visualization tool in their project management software. And I might say, all right, on a project, we know who leads the project. It's the project manager or the project leader. And someone else is just an analyst. And that analyst makes, say, $60,000 a year. And that analyst comes to you and says, I just got an offer to go across the street and make 75000 and you think, well, that person's just an analyst. You can go, maybe. But what if that analyst were actually a linchpin? What if that person were intricately involved in different aspects of the project, things that you could not possibly determine by looking at a bunch of emails? What if that were one of the green people here that was actually one of the key points here on all of these projects? There's no way that you can determine that from email. Other effects of emailing too much, and then I'm going to tee off on jargon. We become confused and overwhelmed. Again, research from the book indicates that many white collar employees are reaching a tipping point. They can't handle any more stuff. It's no surprise that things fall between the cracks. Didn't you get my email? How many times have we, had it, have, have we heard that? Right? Well, if you've got an inbox of 300 or so, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often. It's also nearly impossible to find information. Google indexes the web, and last time I checked, it can index roughly 30 trillion web pages. It's an astonishing number. I don't care how much email you get, you're nowhere near that. If you have 3,000 or 30,000 messages in your inbox, I guarantee that you can't find something that you need, and it's happened to everyone, myself included. Yes, you can use folders, you can use tags, you can use advanced search, keywords, negative keywords, date ranges, all that stuff. And look, email search has improved dramatically over the last 15 years. But don't tell me that it's as good as searching the web. It simply isn't. We also confuse customers and partners and often annoy them. Uh, constant contact is a marketing company. Everyone at some point has received a constant contact email list, email. And they did research, and the single biggest reason that people unsubscribed from email lists was, guess what? I get too much email. We also lose focus. Here's some more interesting research from the book. Our attention spans are declining dramatically. In 2000, the average American had an attention span of roughly 13 seconds. That means nothing to you because you don't have any context. I'm about to give you some. That number dropped to 10, per, uh, 10 seconds in 2013. And this data comes from the National Center of Biotechnology Information. Does anyone know what it is for an average goldfish? Nine seconds. Yes, we are now trailing the goldfish. By constantly going back and forth and checking our phones and checking email, we are now unable to pay attention longer than the cute fish here. This is while driving while texting is four times more dangerous than driving while drunk. When you're drunk, you're at least trying to pay attention. But when you're texting, you're not. So is it any surprise that things fall between the cracks? But let's say that I could wave my magic wand and all email unnecessary chains and threads and pointless information just goes away. Does business communication all of a sudden get fixed? And I'd argue no, which leads me to the other problem with business communication, and that is jargon. I don't know what omni-channel engagement mapping is either, but there's a reason that things like this are actually fairly common. Now, as I said before, everybody uses jargon at some times, myself included. And in fact, in the planning for this meeting or this talk, Gregory and I went back and forth, and I said, hey, before the book comes out, would you like to see the galley? 
and he responded with what's a galley? Well, the galley is basically the PDF that goes to the printer to print one of these. To his credit, Gregory asked. And when I was on the, um, going through the motions to get approved as a vendor here to speak at Cisco, which wasn't the easiest thing, Gregory said, we're on it, my FA is looking at it. To which I responded, what's an FA? It turns out that it's a financial admin. So everyone uses jargon. In some cases, it's an innocent mistake. It wasn't like I was trying to sound all pompous and I know that Gregory wasn't. This brings to mind one of my all-time favorite quotes from Einstein. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. I think that this ought to be framed in just about every office or at every cube in corporate America. And jargon absolutely permeates the business world, and it really has for a long time. I'm going to make the case in a few minutes that this problem has actually exacerbated over the last 10 to 15 years. And again, all of us are guilty of using it. These are just some of my favorites here, but these are a bit abstract, and it's time for me to call some people out on it. Everyone has heard of Twitter. What are they, right down the road here? This is the company's vision statement from November of 2014. 220 characters of pure nonsense. Does anyone, under, does anyone know the current limit for characters on a tweet? 140? 140, correct. So think about it. Twitter couldn't even get its own vision statement into a single tweet. And I wasn't the only person who noticed this. Dennis Berman tweeted, he's the Wall Street Journal's business editor, that it contained 35 words, 62 syllables, four clauses, and two grammatical errors. <laughs> And Dick Costello seems like a really bright guy, but a few months ago, he confused investors on a quarterly conference call by talking about his vision of eccentric circles. Now, the word he meant, and he's used it twice, so it wasn't just a, a Freudian slip, maybe it was, concentric circles. Either way, what are you talking about? That's kind of a problem when your company is valued at $30 billion and it's trading at some ridiculously rich multiple. It's usually a good idea to be clear with the people who are buying your stock. Here's a recent press release. This one's in the book, and it comes from Computer Science Corporation that announced its next generation big data platform as a service. This is a complete mess. 61 words, 380 characters, just about every piece of jargon you can imagine, and an absolutely terrible acronym, BDPAAS. True story, I went to a conference last year and CSC had a booth and I went up to the guy and said, so is anyone using BDPAAS? And the guy was amazed. He said, oh, you heard of it. Well, let me tell you about it. And he talked for about five minutes and I said, again, is anyone actually using this? And he kept equivocating and finally said, well, no, it's very new. And I don't think that people knew what they were buying. My first book, Why New Systems Fail, is about ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, and CRM, Customer Relationship Management Projects. People knew exactly what they were buying, something that would help them with payroll, supply chain, financial, uh, financial accounting. Even then, 60% of the time, those projects fail. What are your odds of success when you don't know what you're buying? And this brings up one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite movies. What we've got here is failure to communicate. This isn't just big companies. There's um, one fairly small company here in the Valley and the quote here comes from Scott McNeely, one of the co-founders of Sun Microsystems, about company X and WAS technology and middleware. I don't know what this company does. People have short attention spans. I was at a different conference last year for one of my clients, name, nameless, and I went as a member of the media. I wasn't speaking at this particular event. Again, I write for Wired and HuffPo and blah, blah, blah. And after about an hour of listening to one of the senior people throw out more acronyms than I could count, I raised my hand and said, excuse me, can you tell me what ABC and XYZ mean? And the woman kind of looked at me and a few other people shrugged and they answered my question. Two hours later, I'm going for lunch. And a few people were pointing at me and they walk up to me and said, yeah, you're the guy, we were looking for you. And I said, oh, okay, hi. Yeah, I'm Phil. I said, yeah, you were the guy who asked the question. I said, yes. Said, we didn't know what those were either. I said, oh, you're with the media. What, what outlets do you write for? They said, no, we're employees. So the own employees <laughs> don't know what their own senior management was talking about. It was a complete mess. Here is a CMO's LinkedIn profile, which, again, contains just about every piece of jargon you can imagine for a marketing folk. And it doesn't make any sense. I don't know what this person does. And to me, that's a problem. When I see a business card, that has a title that makes no sense to me or see a LinkedIn pile like this, does it make you want to know more or less? But this isn't just executives and marketing consultants. You would think that professional speakers and authors around business and technology are actually very clear. 
some are, some aren't. This is a sentence out of the author Brian Salas's book, The End of Business as Usual. It's something about a next work and outperforming terrestrial networks and I just, I don't, if anyone knows what this means, please talk to me during the book signing because I don't understand it. And after I read this, I put down the book and I never picked it up since. Now, this begs the question, if I'm talking about business and technology, do I have to use jargon? Short answer is no. No one disputes the value of literacy, right? We need to know how to read and write. Well, if you take a look at where business is now and where it's going in the future, I think you can safely say that there'll be more data and more technology. So this need to be able to speak to people in English about data and technology without confusing them has never been more pronounced. And some people say, well, you can't do that. If I'm talking about big data, I have to use terms like distributed file systems and parallel processing and fault tolerance and unstructured data. Depends on your audience. I had lunch last year with a friend of mine who is an incredibly techy guy. This guy make, puts me to shame. And his son is there as well, his son's about 16. And his, his father was talking about HPC, high performance computing, and all these other things. You can guess what his son was doing. So I stopped about 15 minutes in and said, hey Jacob, do you understand what we're talking about? He said, what do you think? So I said, have you heard of Twitter? He said, yeah. Have you heard of YouTube? Have you heard of Facebook? Said, yeah. There's a lot of data out there, right? He goes, yeah. Well, that's kind of what we're talking about. Now, of course there's more to it, but people forget their audience. So yes, there's a way of talking to people about data and technology without confusing them. But as B.F. Skinner once said, and he is an American psychologist, this is also one of my favorite quotes, the real problem is not whether machines think, but whether people do. And this begs the question, why is jargon so prevalent today? And there are a bunch of different answers. But let's run through the usual suspects. Anyone a fan of this movie? One of my favorites. Talk to me later. I actually met Gabriel Byrne a few years ago. First up, management consultants. People think that management is a science when any, it's anything but. Again, this is Walter White for you Breaking Bad fans out there. Water always boils at 100 degrees Celsius. It always freezes at zero degrees Celsius. That's true as long as there's one atmospheric pressure. That's always true. Yet in the business world, there is no such certainty. One company could stick to its knitting, to quote Jim Collins. Another company could diversify. They could be in the same industry. Those different strategies might work for each company. There is no science in management. If anything, it's a social science or it's a discipline. It's an important discipline, but it's not a science. Now, if you're paying consultants $300 an hour and they camp out for a year, and at the end of spending $2 million of your money, they come back with something that seems really trite and probably will work, you're going to wonder, why did we pay them this much? So management is not a science. Has anyone heard of SEO, search engine optimization? Okay, it's not everyone has, but to make a long story short, there are two ways to get to the top of search results. So let's just use the first page of Google. Let's assume that you set your default at 10. How do you get to the top? Number one, you can buy your way up there through paid ads. That's how Google makes 95% of its revenue. So if I wanted to buy an ad for best speakers about communication in San Francisco, I can do that. The problem is, if I'm paying per click, that can get expensive and everybody who clicks doesn't actually hire me. The second way is organic. So if the New York Times or Quartz or Forbes does a huge article about me about how I'm the world's greatest speaker and everyone links to it, guess what? When people organically search, that's where I show up. Now, the importance of being at the top of Google search has always been important and that's never been more important than today. If you occupy that number one spot, all else being equal, you can expect to receive 30 to 35% of the hits. Now, if you take a look, there's a major drop off there after one and two, but particularly as you go from 10 to 11. In many instances, if you are on the second page, you might as well be invisible. Now, if you're searching for Kim Kardashian, you can be on page 75 and you'll still probably get a lot of traffic because everyone seems to search for Kim Kardashian, but most people aren't searching for that in the workplace. Now, if you think about it, SEO in a way perversely explains why companies like CSC are inventing new terms. Well, if you Google uh, data platform as a service, a company by the name of Cloudant shows up and IBM bought Cloudant last year or the year before. Well, we're big data platform as a service and we're a next generation one to boot. So yes, if you're searching for that particular term, maybe CSC shows up number one, but that just means that there's more jargon out there. So in a way, it kind of makes sense. And there are other more prosaic reasons for jargon. Some people think that they're sounding smart or important, 
right? There's nothing wrong with using a simple word. When I hear words like leverage or utilize, I think to myself, why do you need to use that? Why not use a word like use? It basically means the same thing. But many times we think, well, utilize just sounds more impressive. But if you throw utilize in, which has what, three syllables, along with other polysyllabic words like polysyllabic, you start to confuse people. There's this fear of simplicity, right? Why are we so afraid to use simple words? I don't understand it. Culture and custom are certainly important. Jargon, like email, begets more jargon. If you look at the chief executive of a company, if that person uses phrases about strategy and alignments and synergies, then it's kind of natural for that to sort of filter down. Um, there's a great book on Enron called The Smartest Guys in the Room, and it's an amazing book about corporate culture. People were afraid to challenge what they knew in many cases were very questionable at a minimum accounting tactics. There's just more stuff out there. I, I didn't hear of Uber two years ago. Now it's the talk of the town. Things happen faster than ever. We are absolutely living in an era of big data. There is more data out there than ever. There's more stuff. Again, there's this pressure on companies to not only create a term, but then try to own it. Why do I want to create a spreadsheet if people search for spreadsheets and it comes up as Microsoft Excel? Why not create something else? Change is happening faster than ever. There's a great deal of research in the book that indicates that we are seeing things faster than ever. It took something like 50 years for a quarter of the American population to adopt radios, and it was something like 25 years for television and 10 years for computers. With smartphones, it was something like five years. Things are happening faster than ever. And we're often oblivious to the effects of jargon. There was a study done in 2010 about jargon, and I'm gonna talk about that a bit later. So this isn't simply my opinion, this is actually research. But you might think, so what, right? We use a lot of jargon. What are the effects? First of all, it confuses and overwhelms employees. I think that's very difficult to dispute. And I know for a fact that it causes lost sales. Why are you buying something when you don't understand what you're purchasing, right? Batting averages aren't exactly great here. It causes delays, it causes failed projects. People don't know what they need to do. They aren't clear. I've gotten into it with other consultants or clients and I've said, what do you need me to do? And they wouldn't give me a straight answer. I said, I can't help you until you give me that answer. It also decreases clarity. I mentioned a few minutes ago a study done in 2010 by a bunch of Swiss researchers. And they discovered that people who used excessive jargon, corporate speak, legalese, were actually viewed as less trustworthy. In Amazing irony, the authors advocated for, and I'm not making this up, linguistic concreteness. <laughs> we need to be more linguistically concrete. You mean clear. Makes no sense to me. So it erodes credibility and trust in an organization. We just don't trust people who can't seem to speak to us in plain English. All right. So I've convinced you, and we're going to have time for some questions after this. What are some things I can do to start communicating better at work? First up, recognize that clear communication doesn't guarantee anything. I live in Las Vegas, and by law, I have to gamble at least once a year. That's a joke. My game is blackjack, although I do like poker as well. And the last time I played a hand of blackjack, I had was dealt 11 with a dealer showing a six. The goal, for those of you who don't know in blackjack, is to either A, make the dealer bust, or B, hit 21, or even both. What do you do in this situation if you're me with the red cards? Double down, absolutely. Every day and twice on Sunday. I doubled down, I pulled a four, dealer hit 21, and I lost. But I would make that bet every time. The point here is that by communicating clearly, you're not guaranteeing anything. But I like your odds a lot better if, than if you're communicating in an unclear way. We also like to demonize PowerPoint. Has anyone read the book by Brad Stone on Amazon, The Everything Store? Fascinating book. Amazon is notoriously secret. Check it out. Uh, Amazon doesn't break out earnings from AWS, the web services division, cloud computing. It doesn't tell you how many Prime memberships it sold. It doesn't tell you how many Kindles it sold. It's a very opaque organization. But Bezos did a ton of research. It's the best book on the company by far. And he discovered that at senior meetings with Jeff Bezos, the CEO, they sit in silence for up to 30 minutes. Bezos believes that PowerPoint is a fundamentally ineffective tool. It inhibits deep thought. Now, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Again, I think you need to blame the Indian, not the arrow. But Amazon execs will read memos at a, at a six page maximum on things like strategy, things like direction, things like new products. So emailing back and forth doesn't really make a lot of sense and Bezos is smart enough to figure that out. Now, I'm not a fan of top 10 lists. Every time I see one, I think of number 11 or number 12 that would have been there. But 
I'll make an exception here. Things that you can do right now, and then we'll have time for some questions. Look for communication canaries in a coal mine. I recently approached a company about sponsoring my book tour, and this company makes collaboration software. I got in touch with the PR person, and we went back and forth over email, and I finally said, well, why don't we have a conversation? Here's my phone number, and here's a link to my schedule. And she responded with, can't talk, too busy, have to do this over email. More than a little ironic, considering she was representing a company that was selling communication software. I'm actually glad that it happened, because I don't want that person involved, if I can help it. If there is an emergency, I can't get in the room, I don't have someone like Bettina who's driving me to the event, and the only thing I can do is email her. I don't want that relationship. So think about that, if there's a partner or a potential applicant who emails too much, will not, not for everything, but when it's time to have a conversation, will not have that conversation. It's also important to avoid the curse of knowledge. For those of you who don't know, this means, going back to my example earlier, that as someone who's written a bunch of books, I know what a galley is. And it's very natural for me to assume that other people do as well. But not everyone knows what one is. So think about it. We know what we know, but other people don't know. Again, it doesn't come from a bad place, but realize that other people may not have your same level of knowledge. It's also important to clearly define your terms. When I asked earlier about SEO, most of you nodded your head, but a few of you didn't. So it takes me, what, an extra minute to define that term in a simple way. Of course there's more to it, but when I see people dropping acronyms like that conference I attended, and even the only employees didn't know what the senior people were talking about, to me that is a failure of business communication um, personified. Next up, I'm big on saving your syllables. No, you can't reduce everything to one syllable, but to me there are certain words that I try never not to use because I'm wasting my syllables. And if I do have, say, a, a long sentence in one of my books, or two in a row, I'll make sure that the next one is short. There's a certain cadence to when I write and hopefully when I speak. Sometimes pausing is a good thing. If you watch any of the best comedians in the world, watch their timing. Certain jokes, as I write in the book, only work with a pause. And I will not engage in email conversations. I just had a piece run this morning on courts. Love my PR person. And in it, I, I talk about my three email rule. After three, we talk. Now, occasionally I'll have to bend it, but I will not have a conversation over email, not because it's just a waste of my time. It's not effective, right? I lose track of certain things. Oftentimes, a two-minute conversation obviates the need for 10 emails, right? I wanna get, I'd rather get 20 emails a day that matter than 200 that don't. I'm also a big fan of picking up the phone. There are certain times, certain conversations that require a phone conversation. A couple years ago, I went to a conference and I got a text. Phil, you behaved very inappropriately today. Hello. So I picked up the phone and said, yeah, I got your message. Um, let's talk. Got another text message back. Got your message, can't talk. We're really upset with you. What did I do? Picked up the phone. Got your text. We're doing this in person. And we did it in person. And it was so much easier to have that conversation because you know, you've all heard about internet trolls, right? I, I write for Wired, and invariably, if I look at the comments, right, Phil, you're an idiot, you're living in 1998. No one would ever say that to me to my face, right? It doesn't mean if I was inappropriate, then it's time for me to have that conversation, but I want to have that conversation either on the phone or in person, particularly when the person is at the same conference. It's not like I had to get on a plane and go to India. Less is usually more. Um, has anyone ever heard of the um, phrase TLDR, too long, didn't read? I think about those massive emails I used to send on this project, and, I, and if I could do it all over again, I would have maybe set up a phone call or something like that and not bombarded people with emails. And if you're unsure about what a term means, then ask. And this is anathema in any organization because no one wants to fear, feel silly. I know that I got a lot of quizzical looks at that conference when I asked people, what do X, Y, Z, and ABC mean? People think, who is this idiot? Well, it turns out I wasn't really an idiot at all because some of the own employees at the companies didn't understand what those things were either. When possible, as I said, try to avoid really long sentences. I'm amazed at how many people, in fact, on Facebook last night, my editor um, on a number of my books had posted a sentence from one of the a manuscript she's editing. And it made absolutely no sense, no matter how many times you read it. And this was an author. This wasn't somebody who worked in IT, uh, Milton the squirrely IT guy from Office Space. And then I'm a big fan of these new collaborative tools. Uh, they minimize the number of email. The goal is not to eliminate email. I don't think it's possible, and I don't even think it's desirable. There's certain things that should not be out there. But I'm of the belief that rather than respond to a long question in an email that exists in my inbox and that person's inbox, I could say write a blog post on it. 
and I can point someone to that blog post and say, here you go, this pretty much answers your question. It's good for my SEO, it's good for my sanity, and I want most of my knowledge to be out there. That doesn't mean everything. I don't put my tax returns online. I will get emails from my accountants and those are private. But I don't understand why the default in an era of increased transparency is private. When people say, well, this tool could be hacked, well, email could be hacked. So there are these new tools out there. Uh, like I said, whether it's uh, Smartsheet or HipChat or Jive or Yammer, these tools are so useful. And guess what? The learning curve is very short. Why? Because they're effectively social networks inside the organization. I'll bet you a Coke that most people here have used a social network at some point. Is anyone here not on Facebook? Okay, everyone here is on Facebook. If you take a look at these tools, they're written in a way that's very similar to Facebook. There are hashtags you can do at someone. You could tag it. You can make it very easy to search and share. So that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Here's how you get in touch with me. And we have time for some questions, whether they're here or in Poland or at North Carolina, whatever you want. Or Cisco TV. Yes. This is going to be more um, an academic question, not, not, not necessarily a business question. Okay. You mentioned email and yeah, but, you know, how, how much we're getting, all of us. And you also mentioned you know, probably using the phone. Uh, you know, before the phone, there was this thing called conversation, right? We go knock on our neighbor's door and say, you know, let's have a conversation. Now we call. Basically, calling has evolved to a point where um, it has become almost second nature to us, something that exists. Email hasn't gotten that chance of evolving. So my, my question, it didn't have that, that you know, duration of time. Email started when? Just recently, in, in terms. Uh, and so my question is, instead of um, just simply saying less why not evolve email to a point where it will be a much more effective communication mechanism? Okay, for those of you who didn't hear, if I, if I could just simplify the question, basically why not just use a better email, correct? Would that be a fair? An evolved email. An evolved email, okay. We could have a long debate, but I'd argue that email actually has changed. Search has gotten better, there are new email applications. In fact, the new Gmail tool is trying to be a smarter email. Google is saying we want your life to be in Gmail. We want your email to intelligently read and alert you to things. That didn't exist a long time ago. So I do think that email has evolved. But I reject the notion that we, you should use our inboxes as our task management applications. I happen to use Todoist. I don't want an email reminding me to do things. Because if I had to go in my inbox to remind myself to watch Breaking Bad, or Better Call Saul, the second show, then I might go in there to check that reminder and you just sent me a note of something I have to drop and do. So it's very easy for me to get distracted and I may remember, forget why I went in there in the first place. So I don't like using email as this catch-all. I don't think it should be a project management tool or task management tool. I think it should be for discrete communications, not for collaborations. But we could talk a lot more about it and I know that there were some more questions. Anything on Cisco TV? Right. For me? Oh. Okay. Anything in the room? Um. <laughs> Nothing. Erin. Okay. Come on. Here we have a tendency, if not on email, we'll go to instant message. We won't pick up the phone and call. I think even if we were leave to leave a message for someone else within Cisco, they may never check it. They'll say, I don't check it. So what do you recommend? I mean, then we go back and forth between email and chat and email and chat, and it interrupts your flow. Absolutely. I don't think that there needs to be one tool. I think it's contextual. Some people don't respond well. In fact, if you talk to millennials about voicemail, they go, we don't leave them. In fact, one company recently stopped paying, I think it was Coca-Cola for its top 100 execs, stopped paying for voicemail because no one left voicemails. So I pay for the service. I don't think that there is one tool. It's easy for us to rely on email because you can have read receipt or prove that it was sent or something like that. But to me, I don't want it to be contaminating my inbox. 
Um, I, I can't tell you that there's one tool. I feel like all communication going back hundreds of years is contextual. Some people wouldn't want to receive typed letters because they weren't personal. There's a great book that I quote uh, in the new one called The Better Pencil by Dennis Barron. And we have these reactions to technology, but people like Plato thousands of years ago objected to the very idea of a book because knowledge needed to be told through story and not codified in a book. And when the typewriter was invented, people hated the typewriter because if I wrote something out, you saw my, my, my handwriting. It was personal. It couldn't be mass produced. Typewriters were impersonal. They were loud. Right? Does that sound anything like the, the tools we have today? So I can't say that there is one tool. I'd say in all likelihood there will probably be a series of tools, a bunch of clubs in the bag. I'm not saying you should have 10 collaboration tools because that, that could be a mess. But when you think about it, not using a tool is actually very detrimental. I read a story a couple of months ago about a newly hired executive who refused to use, I think it was Trello, which is a project management tool. And the person was 52, 53 years old, not old, but kind of stuck in his ways. And they told him, quite frankly, you need to use this tool because this needs to be the central repository of information. He said, I don't do that. I do email. And they wound up letting him go. So I can't say that there is one tool. Um, it might be OK for you to send me an instant message because I respond to that. But if you know that I don't even inst haven't even installed an insert name of instant message tool, then it's probably not a good idea to send me on that, a message that way. Other questions? Are we doing time? We have actually uh, only two minutes left. And we you know, Dana, I don't know if my sound is on. Oh, there we go. I'm going to, um, instead of handling that now, because I want to make sure we have the, we save the last two minutes for closeout, um, if you can capture that, I will either directly respond to that person, or if relevant to all, I will respond and send it out in the, in the follow-up. Good? By email? <laughs> I taught you nothing. <laughs> you weren't listening to a word Don't I said. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've got a question here on UTP. Oh, wait. No, I don't have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Yeah, question. That's That's question. Yeah. We do have questions here still if, if, if we've got a minute. She's staying in the last two minutes for closeout. Yeah. Okay. 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 I just don't want to get shut off from, from TP. Go ahead. Who's the question? RTP? RTP? Yeah, RTP. Go ahead. Okay. Who's got it? Sure. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. So uh, when I first joined Cisco, and I'm getting to a story to a question. Um, I, uh, I know, very rapidly. All my emails were in red font, and people thought I was yelling at them all the time. And so my question to you is, do you have any recommendations on font and size? <laughs> Don't use Comic Sans. <laughs> Google Comic Sans font. In fact, when LeBron James left the Cleveland Cavaliers, Dan Gilbert, the owner of the Cavs, wrote a scathing sort of scorned lover email and published it on the website using Comic Sans font. I always felt like the font episode was the one Seinfeld they should have done because you're right, different fonts. If you use Courier, this is a whole rant with me. Courier is a fixed width font. It's very retro, right? Kind of boring. Red, I agree, absolutely connotes anger. Um, certainly with explanation points in all caps, and that's another reason that I think messages are often not received. You were really angry. Why? We used all caps. And that's also, we also make ourselves look dumber with things like Siri. And look, voice recognition is a lot better than it used to be, but it's not perfect. And I've always reminded myself to check before I hit send because I sound like I've got a fourth grade education. So we could definitely talk about that later, but I want to leave time for the wrap up. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Good that was job. just teasing you. <laughs> I know.